All right. So this is the Creative Conference with your host, Rob Hardy, and I'm having a conversation with the amazing Roger Bob, president and CEO of Bobcat Films, filmmaker, director, producer, New Yorker. Yeah. He's been a part of a lot of great projects from Reasonable Doubt, one of my favorite shows uh, on Hulu. He's done everything from Ricky Smiley, For Real, Man and Wife, um, you know, Meet the Browns, Ricky Smiley Show, a bevy of movies from Why Did I Get Married, and so on and so forth. Um, it's an honor to sit down with you, my man. You know, you and I go way back. And That's correct. Uh, it's always good to see you, man. How you been? I've been good. I've been good. I see we both rocking the salt and pepper these days. <laughs> Listen, no question. Look, man, I'm 50 years old, so it's a real uh, thing. Yes, sir. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I'm a little older than you, but, you know, we, we still look young, I, I think. So we're good. <laughs> Listen, we're just going to go with the fact that we both look and feel young. There you go. You know That's right. What, 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 what do you say? Uh, it's, it's better to look good than to feel good. Uh, there you go. Billy Crystal. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> no, it's, it's an honor, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So listen, uh, you know, so give us a, a, a snapshot about your origin story. Tell us what it yeah. was like for you growing up. All right. So uh, I was born in London um, and then uh, my family moved to New York when I was uh, four years old, uh, moved to Brooklyn. Um, and so, um, you know, I was this like chubby kid from Brooklyn with an accent in the mean street, a chubby kid from London with an accent in the mean streets of Brooklyn. So that didn't really sit too well with the other kids. Right. So. You know, I was getting picked on a little bit, you know, and so basically what happened was my and I would, you know, kind of get into fights and stuff like that. So my mother was like enough. So basically I couldn't leave the house. And so consequently, I just sat in the house a lot, you know, when I was very young and just watched a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually, you know, um, prompted my love of, of film and television. Just like, you know, I just sat around with my little British accent and I just watched all these great older television shows, you know, The Good Times and Jeffersons and Happy Days and even going way back to The Honeymooners and stuff yeah. like that. And that's what really, um, you know, got me, you know, involved in film and television. Just just loving it, just, just as a consumer, you know, I, I liked what I saw. And I always felt like that was something I wanted to, to get involved in. But, you know, it's like I'm living in Brooklyn, it's the 70s, early 80s, and it's like, you know, Hollywood is something that, basically white people did in this land called Hollywood, far, far away from Brooklyn, right? So, you know, I went about my business, you know, uh, continued to go to school, got a little taller, lost some weight, played a lot of sports. So, you know, and that was really, you know, my focus was just, you know, trying to get good grades and, um, you know, graduate from high school. And then um, went to college, uh, I played football. I went to Brooklyn College and I played football there. Um, but still always had this love for film and television, right? And then finally, um, in the early 80s, this young brother from Brooklyn at this neighborhood not too far from mine makes this movie, She's Gotta Have It. And I'm just like, whoa, this guy Spike Lee, you know, this, you know, we could actually do this, you know? But, but still never really thought it was a possibility for me. For me, I was still just a consumer who just loved film, but there was just something inside me that's like, man, I would love to do that. So, you know, Spike Lee does his thing and then um, um, Robert Townsend does his thing and then all these filmmakers and then um, uh, Robert Rodriguez comes out with El Mariachi. And, you know, they would always write books about the process at that point in their career, right? So then um, I'm working, uh, get out of school. I'm working as a paralegal at a law firm down on Wall Street. This, this is a long story since we got some time, right? So That's all good. I'm, I'm working as a paralegal down on Wall Street. You know, I've got my suspenders. Um, you know, um, the firm that I work with did mergers and acquisitions. So, you know, I, I had all the inside information, doing my inside trading. <laughs> so, you know, life was good, but there was always something inside of me that still wanted to do this film and television thing. Mm -hmm. So... What happened was my firm actually had me go to Los Angeles to monitor a trial, right? So I'd never been to the West Coast, never been to LA. And at this point, I'm like mid-20s at this point, right? So I go to I go to LA, first time I go to Los Angeles ever. And um, and uh, I'm staying in this corporate apartment. And then one day I look over my balcony and they're making a movie like right down the street in front of me. And I had never seen a movie being made before. And so, Rob, if I tell you, I just sat there 
stood there and looked at this for like three, four hours. I'm just looking. I don't really know what anybody's doing, but I'm looking. I'm kind of getting, okay, I don't know who that guy is. And that guy's carrying a light. Okay, and there's the actors. I'm looking. I'm like, man, I got to do this. I got to do this. So I made a commitment to myself. I said, okay, when I go back to New York, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go to film school. I'm going to be a filmmaker. Like that was, that was, that was the day in my head. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I didn't know what a filmmaker was, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. Cause I knew whatever I'm watching down on that street, I want to be a part of, right. That was a Sunday. So the very next Monday, I was supposed to leave like a week later, the very next day, my, my firm calls me and says, look, we're going to extend your stay there like another eight months. I'm just like, oh, dang. I had this plan. So I just started, I'm like, okay, I got eight months, whatever. So I just started reading all these books, you know, that Spike and Robert Rodriguez wrote about filmmaking. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make a film right here myself. Like, honestly, I, I, had, I knew nothing about it. I just, just from what I read, I said, I'm going to make a film right here. I got eight months. And so I was staying in these corporate apartments. There were two other corporate apartments that the attorneys would only visit on the week uh, uh, during the weekday. They would leave like from from third from Friday to Monday. So I wrote this script, and I just started. Um, there was a there was a there was a uh, there was an organization called the uh, American uh, what was it called the Black Filmmaker Foundation. Yeah, Black Filmmaker BFF. Foundation BFF. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, they had an L.A. branch. And so I called. I was like, look, I'm, I'm making a film. I got a little money to make this little short film, um, you know. And so they gave me some people. And so one of the people that I met was Malcolm Lee. At that point, he had just I think he had just graduated from film school and he was doing like the Disney Writers Program. Yeah. Uh, and he also knew my brother. So I was like, hey, Malcolm, you know, I need you to help me. He was like, cool, I'll help you. So then, you know, got Malcolm in. I just started cold casting people. Hill Harper was in my very first film. Tika Wells was in my very first film. Wow. Um, there's a writer, her name is Tony Ann Johnson. She wrote Ruby, Ruby Bridges. She was in my first film. So I got everybody together. Long story short, I did this film. I shot, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Made every mistake in the book, but I did it, right? So I did this film. I edited it there. The eight months is up. I go back to New York. I get called into the partner's office. I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, so I hear, you know, you're over there making movies while you're supposed to be working. I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, you know, on my free time, I did make a film. He's like, well, did you use the corporate offices? I said, yeah, on the weekends. And he's like, but you didn't have permission. I said, no, because, you know, it was, it was one of those things where, what's the saying where you would rather just do it rather than ask ask forgiveness than ask permission. Than ask I knew if I asked permission. For, right. I knew if I asked him, they would say no. So I did. Anyway, he promptly fired my ass. But I always say, yeah, that was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was making great money. I probably would still be there right now. So now he, you know, I, I'm kicked to the curb, don't have a job, but I do have this film, the short film, which my first mistake was I made a short film that was 39 minutes which is basically too long to be a short film and too short to be a feature. So that was one of my first mistake. So filmmakers out there, first thing is when you make a short film, 20 minutes or less. Okay? Yes. So anyway, so I entered the film in some festivals and it does well. So I, 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 um, uh, I enroll in the School of Visual Arts um, to basically learn what I didn't know. Um, but and, and this is in LA or New York? This is in New York. This is in okay, New York. got it. Yeah. So School of Visual Arts, so I, I attend the school. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, like I'm a very practical guy. I'm like, okay, so what, how do I be a film? How do I make a career as a filmmaker? Like, what, what do I do? And, you know, I need some more things other than this, this 20 minute film that I have, right? And so I'm like, okay, what's the shortest medium? Um, commercials. I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a spec commercial, right? So I did this commercial, um, you know, with my friends. And then I shot a, like this really low budget music video with another friend I had that was a musician. And I basically cut my, uh, my short film into, um, into a trailer. And so that became my quote unquote trailer. This, so I have not, you know, not only am I a film director, but I'm also a music video director and a commercial director. So I had this reel. And so I sent the reel to all, because I felt, because music videos were popping then, right? right? So I sent the video to all these uh, independent record labels in New York, right? And then one of them called me back, Select Records. And they were like, yo, I loved your video. I'd like, I'd love for you to do a video. I'm like, great. 
what's the budget? He's like, $2,000. I'm like, let's, let's do it. Now, he knows <laughs> good damn well I can't shoot no video for $2,000, but he knows that I'm going to put my money in it to make sure it does well. So that was my first official job. I directed this uh, music video um, for Select Records in New York. And basically, that video got me another video, got me another video, got me another video. Yes, sir. And that's when that I started. That first video, uh, who was the artist? It was... Uh, uh, it was it was called Aura. Um, uh, there was a song called Wiggle It Just a Little Bit. I don't yeah, know yeah, yeah. Um, um, Wiggle so, It Just, just yeah, a Little Bit. So this was that group's sick follow up song. I can't Got remember. It. Yeah, it'll come to me. So so that yeah. was my first play. But it's called Aura, A H O R A, which means now in Spanish, right? I love it. So that that was my first one. So then you know I killed that one. They gave me another one. Gave me another one. But obviously these budgets are really low. So I had to do everything producing it, I'm ADing it, I'm doing craft service, I'm driving people around. So I was producing and directing at the same time. And so what happened was they would call me to do videos that other directors were directing. For that. I was kind of doing both producing and directing these videos. So I was doing that, making a you know somewhat of a living I want, but it's work. So I'm working, right? And so then I hear about the Directors Guild of America has a trainee program, it's assistant director trainee program. And so in this program, if you get in, they train you for two years to be a, a DJ assistant director, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, you know, let me, let me apply to this. I probably won't get in, but you know, I'll do it anyway. Because basically they only pick six people a year and something like 6,000 people a year apply to this thing. It's, and you know, joke was it's easier to get into Harvard than it is to get into this program. So, dude, I don't know how, but, you know, I got into the final round and the final round is like an interview. And, and this and there's no rhyme or reason how they pick. I still don't know how they pick people. I think they just want people who are just really smart and really passionate about it. That's basically the criteria. Right. So I did my interview and I got in I'm like, wow. So I got in this program. And, and the great thing about the program is they pay you a pretty decent salary to train you. So, right. so I got into the program, DJ assistant directors program. I did that for two years in New York. My very first movie was Copland with Robert that was a great Carroll, movie. Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, that's Harvey what, Keitel. Harvey Keitel, yeah. Uh, uh, directed by James Mangold, um, Malik Yoba. Uh, I, that's where I first met him. He kind of been instrumental in my whole ascent. And so I, I did that, right? And so then, and I'll tell you a little story, like the, my very first day, very first day on set, um, you know, we have these things called sides. For those of you who don't know, sides are basically mini scripts of what you're going to shoot for that day. And pretty right. much everybody walks around with them and all the actors and everyone references them, right? So I get the sides and the director's assistant says to me, oh, the director needs a, a set of sides. I said, okay, great. Just go in the, the production trailer they write there. So cool. So then they say, okay, Roger, we need the sides on set. We're about to rehearse. I go, we're not there. I'm like, shoot, where did I put the sides? Where did I put the sides? And so they're like, Roger, where's the sides? What's the I'm like, oh, 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 I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Cannot find these damn sides. So I got Harvey Keitel, I got Sylvester Stallone, I got Robert Davis standing around waiting for my dumb ass to get these sides, right? Can't find the sides, can't. So I'm on channel one, and you never go on channel one and tell people what's wrong. I go to channel, <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. I know I had the sides there, but I just can't find the sides. I can't find the sides. They're like, take this to two. <laughs> First of all, right? <laughs> so they're like, well, you got to do something. I'm like, okay, there's a Kinko's. I'm just going to go. So I run, run to Kinko's. I make the sides. I come back. I'm running to set. I get in there and everybody already has the sides. I'm like, what, what, wait, what happened? The director's assistant, she didn't just take one side. She took the whole damn packet of sides, right? So that's where the sides. So anyway, that's my first day of my first movie as a DJ trainer. Anyway, I did that for two years. I, that was my first Copland. I worked with Alan. Um, I worked uh, on uh, New York Undercover, um, Reggie Bythewood, which was a great experience. Um, you know, just worked with Mike Nichols. I worked with him. So I worked with a lot of great directors. Then after that program, um, I worked as a second assistant director and then a first assistant director, and then basically a UPM all in New York City. So I was basically making a living, not directing at this point, because my, my career transitioned into basically producing. And so I'm doing that. Um, I go to this uh, festival called the Acapulco Black Festival. Yes. In Acapulco. Yep. And I'm there and I meet, I meet two people who kind of changed my life. I meet Ruben Cannon. 
yep. um, the casting director, very well known. And I meet these two brothers who had this film called Twa there. <laughs> Right. So I'm like, okay, it's a pretty cool festival in Acapulco. I see once again, you know, brothers doing things, these guys coming out here with this movie that they made and financed all themselves. I'm like, man, I gotta do something like that. So maybe about anyway, a few years later, Ruben calls me. I'm, I'm, again, I'm working as a as a as a producer in New York, and he says, you know, I've hooked up with this guy. Um, he's in Atlanta and he, he you know he wants to do this film and you know he wants an all black crew and uh I was one of the few black first ADs um, in the East Coast. I was actually the youngest black first AD in New York at the time. And so, you know, I, you know, I want you to come meet him and see if you want to work on this film. I'm like, okay, cool. Never been to Atlanta. I didn't know anything about Atlanta except for Freak Nick and, and all that good stuff. So I come to Atlanta. This is now 2003. Um, and he introduces me to the guy that he's working for. This guy's name is Tyler Perry. And I didn't know anything about him. I hadn't seen his plays or anything like that. And anyway, so we made the film Dive of Black Woman. Darren Grant directed it, Tyler starred and produced it and financed half of it. A lot of people don't know that. And um, so I did the film. Um, film come, I go back to New York, film comes out, it blows up. Blows up, $20 million first weekend, unheard of for a black film at that time. So it blows up. So then um, Tyler calls him back to Atlanta. He's like, uh, you know, but the, during the process, it was weird for him because Tyler is a director. He directed his stage plays. And this is the first time, you know, he wrote this, he wrote this piece. He, um, he starred in it. He produced it, but he didn't direct it. Right. And I, you know, and he kept saying, I kept saying, I, during the podcast, saying, you know, you, you know, you can do this if you surround yourself with the right people. You have a vision. You know, you just surround yourself. You just need to surround yourself with people who can execute your vision. You could do this. So. The next movie, he called me and says, look, I want you to come. I want you to work on it. I'm, I'm going to direct it this time. So I come back to Atlanta. We shoot that movie. And while he's shooting that movie, he's working on this uh, sitcom he wants to do called House of Pain. And, right? and, and real quick, the uh, the movie, yeah. was that Daddy's Little Girls? Is that what the, that was? The, the second movie was, no, it was, uh, it was uh, 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 Medea's family, family Reunion. Got with it. Boris Kojo and Lisa Arendelle. Uh, ah. uh, uh, right. Yeah. And so, um, so we did his second film. And then while he was doing that, he was working on this sitcom he wanted to do called House of Pain. And so he was like, you know, I want you to produce a sitcom for me. I'm like, yeah, but I've never produced a sitcom before. He said, well, you know, just go to L.A. for a couple of weeks and just look at how they do it and just come back and do it. So I'm like, OK, <laughs> but that's how he rolls, man. So I go to L.A. I, I knew a couple of people who worked on sitcoms. Um, and so I went and I looked at the process and I came back. I said, like, OK, well, this is what it is. You know, they do it once. Once they do one episode a week. And wait, one episode a week, why, why did they do that? And I took them through the process. I was like, okay, well, they do a rehearsal this day, they have notes this day, then they have a network run through, and then this, this day. And then he's like, yeah, but we're not doing all of that. <laughs> he said, if you don't have to do all of that, how long is it gonna take you to shoot? So it's really all my fault, guys. So I was like, <laughs> well, I mean, you can really shoot it in a day if you don't have any of that process. He's like, well, we're gonna eliminate the whole process. So he did this historic deal with, with Turner um, where, they basically did, a, we did 10 episodes that he financed himself. You know, this is a key phrase here. He, you know, he believed in himself. He had the opportunity to, he had the resources. He financed it himself. You know, he owned the product. Um, and so we did 10 episodes. Um, the 10 episodes aired. Um, at that point, they were the highest rated sitcoms on, on, on TBS at that point. And then he got the, the unprecedented 90 episode pickup. Typically, for those uh, who, who may not understand how television works, you know, you'll typically do a season, and then based on that season, you might get a season or two. But right. what you don't do is get 100 episodes, right? Which is the equivalent of four seasons, depending on on you know how many episodes you do a year. So we got the 90 episodes, and we were basically, and we had gotten it down to a science where we did three episodes a week, right? So typically, so we were doing it in a third of the time. And, you know, that also worked for his economic structure because now, you know, you're not paying what you would pay for a week for, you're getting three of versus getting one of. So, you know, he had a unique economic structure. So anyway, so we did that. And then we did Meet the Browns. We continued to do the movies. And then, um, then he made me the executive vice president of the company. And so, and then we moved into the first studio. Yeah. And everything was great. And we were rocking and rolling and doing all sorts of things. But in the back of my head, I was like, yeah, this is all great, but you know, there's stuff that I want to do. <laughs> you know, the films that I want to make, 
the things that I want to produce that are outside of that that umbrella. Um, and so well, then, well, well, yes. I, I, I want you to pause right there for yes. a second. because I want uh -huh. to ask you I want to ask you uh, two quick things before you continue. Mm -hmm. Number one, you'd mentioned before that you were in just taking you back for a second. You went yeah. to that PGA trainee program mm -hmm. as a person that wants to be a filmmaker, a director, mm -hmm. producer. Mm -hmm. what, went in, what went into your decision to join a program as a first AD if you weren't working as a director or producer? Well, usually the typically first AD, the, the track for a DGA person on the non-directing path is second AD, second, second AD, second AD, first AD, UPM. UPM is a unit production manager, which is essentially the producer. And, but that's the nuts and bolts producer. So there's two types of producers. There's the creative producers, and then there's what we call the nuts and bolts or the line producers, which are basically the ones who sign the checks and make sure they know all the money's going and do the schedules and all that good stuff. So that's, uh, for the DGA, that's called the UPM. So for me, I was producing anyway, right? So I just wanted to do it at the highest level possible. And although I also wanted to direct, you know, I also like producing, I just wanted to be, I just love making movies, Rob. That's what it is. So if I need to sweep a movie set for the rest of my life to get involved and make it, then that's what I would do. So this was an opportunity for me to still be involved in making movies, to potentially do it at the highest level possible. And that's, that's my logic into to why I decided to do that. Plus, at that point, I was mainly producing music videos, and I wanted to to go into um, uh, scripted. So, yeah. so, so with that same, uh, you know, mentality and passion as far as what you wanted to do and the fact that you wanted to be on a film set, making it happen, telling, telling stories, now fast forwarding to now you and Tyler are now partnered together. You're, you know, working on, on great projects mm -hmm. and you obviously have like an onslaught of material that's coming in and out. Correct. Um, so technically, by Roger Bob standards, who was joining the DGA as a trainee, you've arrived at that position. Correct. Take it to the moment where you begin to feel like maybe, you know, a shift was happening as far as what you wanted to do creatively. Well, the shift was I've always wanted to direct, right? And I wasn't directing. I was producing. You know, I was working with directors, I was working with Tyler, I was working with the great directors we had, Kim Fields and Chip Fields and, and Alfonso Ribeiro. And we had some great directors on our, on our sitcom sets, right? But I wanted to direct at that point. So um, shortly before I left, you know, he gave me the opportunity to direct several episodes of House of Pain and several episodes at, at Meet the Browns. And that was a big mistake because then I was hooked then. It's like, no, I, I want to do some more, I want to do more directing, right? Right. But quite frankly, my value to, to him and, and to the company was as a and as the executive vice president, right? So that's when I had to make a decision, okay, well, you know, do I keep doing this or do I continue to follow my passion um, in, 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 in directing and not only directing, but then and create creating shows um, that, that I want to see, you know, that are outside of, of the umbrella that I was working on. So now, real was, quick, when, yeah. when you mentioned, when you mentioned, um, executive vice president is there mm -hmm. a difference between that and your responsibility as a producer and if they are what's the difference yes well the difference is i at that I, I was executive president of the whole company so the sound stage you know so basically i'm dealing i'm talking to lawyers about stuff I'm talking real estate so it wasn't just each individual show that we were making it was the umbrella of tyler perry studios Got so it. that was different and that was another thing because then i i, I started working less and less on the creative side and more and more on the corporate side, you know, and I wanted to get back to that, that creative side. So, so that, that's the difference. Yeah. So, um, so I made a decision, you know, I'm going to open up my own company. Cause I had all the, I mean, I had everybody's number, Rob, you know what I mean? It's like, I could call anybody at that point, you know, we were like the hottest things in town then, right? Yeah. So I had all these opportunities available to me. So, um, I started my own company, Bobcat Films, um, I, I mean, I had a studio, I had an office, you know, so I was like ready to go. So um, I started my own company. This was 2010. Um, no, 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 it was 2013. 2013. So I started my own company, Bobcat Films. And then the very first thing I did was a film called, um, it was called Raising Izzy, which had won um, a screenplay competition. Um, uh, Rockman Dunbar and Vanessa Williams, and that got a whole bunch of NAACP Image Award nominations. That was my very first film, first 
very, very first thing off, off the gate. Simultaneously, I did a show for ESPN um, called The Battle, which was about um, uh, grappling HBCU marching band. So I was doing scripted and non-scripted. So then, you know, you know, so we just hit the ground running. When I say we, I, I, I talk about my longtime collaborator, Angie Bones. So uh, I brought her with Angie me Bones. to my company, got out Angie Bones, shout out. And so yeah. she was my right hand, left hand, and my right foot and my left foot. So, you know, we started this little company and we just, we started cranking them out, cranking them out, cranking them out. So we started developing shows. And the thing is, you know, I wanted to work with people that I had a good relationship with. So I had a good relationship with David and Tamla Mann. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did, uh, a, the funny thing is, we did a, a, a scripted series for them on Bounce TV called Man and Wife that ran three seasons. And then we did a, uh, a um, non-scripted show with them um, called The Mans that ran on BET. Same thing happened with Ricky Smiley, who was a friend of mine. I did a sitcom with him that ran five seasons on TV One. And then we did a non-scripted season that ran another five seasons, Ricky Smiley for real. So it's kind of weird how that happened. But in any case, so I just started um, developing my own projects. At the same time, we also, we're a production services company. So what a production services company does is uh, ABC will come and say, look, we want to shoot the show in Atlanta. Can you all, can you produce this for us? You know, we, we will finance it, but you basically have to put it together. So we started working with different networks, BT, One, ABC, Freeform, where we would offer production services. So, so we would actually produce the shows for them. And we specialize in television movies. Like that was our, our, our bread and butter. So. So simultaneously with the shows we we're developing, we were also offering production services on television movies. So we did like Life Size 2 with Tyre Banks, which is on Freeform, and Same Time Next Christmas with a bunch of people I can't remember right now for ABC. And so, you know, that's basically what we've been doing. And so again, what happened is I started to start producing again, doing less direct directing. And so, Shortly before COVID, I made it. I made decisions like for the next two or three years, I'm just gonna direct. Like I'm not gonna do anything else. I'm just gonna direct. And so I started to just well direct and produce because I'm not gonna direct something that I'm not producing. So so I basically just started directing again. Uh, I, I like the television movie genre, and that's where I have a question for you. So right. I, I basically just worked mainly in, in movies of the week, we used to call them, but basically television movies. And the reason I like television movies versus um, episodic is because in my experience, especially as a producer producing episodic, the directors don't have as much creativity or cre creative say-so versus television movies where essentially, you know, it's, it's kind of your baby. You know what I mean? I mean, cer certainly uh, if you do a movie for ABC or CBS, there's a certain look that they want. But but generally, you know, you kind of get to go in there and do your thing. And, you know, you have basically, you know, uh, what is it, like 99 minutes, you know, to tell your story versus, you know, 44 minutes and a shorter schedule. So I find myself gravitating towards that. So that's my question for you, Rob. You know, as one of the aforemost television directors, working today, how do you, and I, and I remember, I remember you and I, I remember asking you about that um, a long, long time ago, that transition from feature films, which is what you were doing, yeah. to, to television. So explain to me the difference and do you like it? Do you not like it? What would you like to see better? Talk to me. You know, it's interesting, and 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 uh, and I'm gonna have a follow-up question for you right after okay. this, you, you reminded me of something, you know, okay. um, Feature films are great because, as you mentioned, you know, as a director, typically, you know, you have a blank canvas to do your thing and to execute your vision. That's all still based upon who the studio or the financier is and how involved they are. So obviously, the bigger the budget, the more cooks there are in the kitchen, the more people want to influence your filmmaking. That's one of the advantages of being an indie filmmaker and having your own stuff you have a lot more creative freedom to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. That's typically the movie business. And like the higher up the food chain, you go with bigger budgets and higher profile projects, the less creative freedom that you have. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. um, television, it is somebody else's vision 
but you as a director are coming in to figure out how to tell the story that they want to tell in a way that gives them what they want, but creatively still makes it your own. Mm -hmm. They're bringing you in. So then that way, like the, the, the best way I can describe it is if you're a football player, the quarterback goes down, you bring in a new quarterback and you, and that quarterback is supposed to go out there and do just enough to kind of win the game. But if you do it the right way, you can put in a few of these trick plays and design things and, and make some moves to really show people what you can do. And then everybody's excited. They're like, man, you won the game, which is what we needed, but you brought your own thing to it to mm -hmm. kind of make it your own and show why you're a standout person. That is what you always strive to find in television. And if you're doing earlier seasons on shows, typically season one and two, mm -hmm. the show is still trying to find itself. So you have a little bit more creative freedom. Right. The further in, in episodes that you get, dep again, depending on the show, typically it kind of has a way that they do their thing. Mm -hmm. Unless you go to one of these shows where they're like, nope, we want the director to come in and do whatever they want. And so there's some shows I've been to um, where you, you can be episode seven, I mean, season seven, and they're still like, yo, it's Criminal Minds. And in this week, we're in Albuquerque. So how do you want to tell the Albuquerque you know, story? Right. But now we're on the jet, we do it like this. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the headquarters, we do it like this. Otherwise, you do your thing. And that's kind of always you know, what you're faced with. And even if you wind up doing a, a show and you do the pilot and you set the look and you do whatever, the show kind of becomes what it's going to be. And then if you go back in later seasons, <laughs> like, they'll say, man, Rob, we right. love you. We kind of like to do it like this now. You say, right. oh, okay, I get it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you just figure out ways to kind of, uh, you know, do your thing. Uh -huh. but, 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 you know, for me, that reminds me of, as the story that you were telling, I, I noticed something consistent in the storytelling of your journey, which is much like, you know, film versus TV. And that's the pivot. And that is you, Roger, having a situation to where you're pivoting from your initial job to follow your passion of becoming a filmmaker. And then, you know, making another pivot to join the union to kind of, you know, work your trajectory up. to then having the Tyler opportunity to making a pivot to do your own, you know, form your own company. So then pivoting again, when it was getting too much in, in the, in the producing arena and not enough in the directing arena. Tell us about the, that, that feeling that you get when you make, when you know that it's time to pivot and do you ever get nervous or are there mm -hmm. ever friends or family members that say, Hey man, you know, Bobcat is really producing a lot of great stuff. Why don't you just do that? Or Tyler's making amazing material. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just stay there? Mm -hmm. Making all this money as an AD, you know, that's way different from what we're doing in Brooklyn. Why don't mm -hmm. you just stay there? Right. Like, like how so, do you get that courage? So my 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 family is a Caribbean family. So you know, this whole film thing is like foreign to them. <laughs> you know, it's it's doctor lawyer. Of and course. my brother's a lawyer and my yes. sister's a doctor. So Got I'm it. the mixed, I'm the mixed up middle kid <laughs> that my mother's always like, you know, are you gonna work today? Are you gonna work today? Are you gonna work to you know, she's always worried about the next thing. Um so I say it to say, though, they've been incredibly supportive. So, you know, my family was never like, well, early on, they were concerned because I wasn't really making a lot of money. So it was like, you know, what, what's going on? But, you know, they, they knew I had, you know, I was a relatively smart guy and I had drive and desire. It's always been positive. Like, I've never, I've had people after, because when I left, I didn't tell anybody I was leaving, obviously, except for Tyler. Like, I literally didn't tell anybody. Right before, I, I sent an email, press send, and I was out the door you know, to all my colleagues, you know, it's been great, blah, 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 it's fantastic. I'm about to start this new company, but, you know, and that, that's pretty much how I left. And, and the next day I drove into my own spot and I started rolling. So, um, you know, obviously, Rob, there's a little bit of trepidation. Um, I, I knew when I was left Tyler, I knew that was the right thing to do because my everything in me was like, you know, and I knew there was almost no way I could, I would really have to try hard to mess that up. Because I just had so many resources avail available to me at that time. You know, it's like, it was kind of like, you know, Michael Jackson going solo. It's like, you really got to mess that up, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I had this incredible success that, you know, thanks to Tyler, love him to death, um, that he afforded me the opportunity. So it was really like, all right, let's take advantage. So, 
So that pivot wasn't was relatively easy. Now after I made it, you know, and he continued to do his thing. Everybody's like, man, why you laugh? Oh, I was like, I'm cool. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm doing my yeah. thing. So um, there's always a l- slight trepidation. And, and I, I guess you wouldn't be human if you didn't have slight trepidation when you're ever making a, a major uh, move in your life. You know, it's like when you have a child or get married, you know, it's a major thing. You can't, no one can tell me you're hundred percent. This is going to be awesome. You know, right. it's like, you, you gotta, you know, you gotta think it through. But you know, once I made a decision, boom! You know, it, it's all cylinders. Let's let's do it. So, and, you know, fortunately, I've been very blessed to to, to have been successful um, in all, all the moves that I've made. So, I think that's I think that you know that's really inspirational because I think that there are a lot of you know us out here and a lot of people listening that have dreams and aspirations. But once you get on the ship in this business, you kind of make it in. It's easy to get either comfortable with where yeah. you, are, yeah, yeah. Um, or, you know, uh, discouraged because you haven't yeah. gotten that promotion or you haven't mm-hmm. done things. So I think it's, you know, it's important to hear from people how you continuously keep going for what means something to you in here. That's that's cool. um, that's big. Yeah. I always tell people, you know, especially people starting out, you know, look, I get it. You know, you have jobs, you have families to feed, you know, you got to earn a living, you know, and this film thing. And the, and the funny thing is, you know, I just told my story. Your story is totally different. I don't know any people who have the exact same story as to how they've been successful in this industry. Everybody has a different way. So there's really not one way to do it. And that's actually a blessing and a curse because a curse and a blessing, not end in a blessing, because the blessing is however you're doing it, that's the way to do it. You know, it's not like you go to law school and be a lawyer. You know, it's not like that in the film industry. There's so many different ways you know, to be successful in this industry and to get your product out. And for the people out there who are just starting off, you know, I always say, they say, you know, well, how do you know if you really have a passion for it? You have, you know, you have a passion for this industry because every time you may want to quit or stop, something in you just doesn't let you do it. Even if you're thinking about it still, that means you still have the passion to do it. And you only, and my whole thing was, you know, it's like, when I got fired from the law firm and I'm thinking, what am I gonna do with my life? It's like, you only live once, you know what yeah. I mean? So just go for it. Like, what's the worst that could happen? You know what I mean? So, so, and everyone who's been successful in this industry has had that moment at some point in their lives. So, you know, for the people out there who, who are still starting and may not be where they are, we've all been there, but you know, you have to just continue to, to persevere. And, you know, fortunately I tell people, you know, be, you just gotta do it. It, when whatever level you're doing it, if you're an actor and you're not getting calls or additions, you're just starting out, you still got to do them church plays or them local regional plays or, you know, like Issa Rae, do your own content. There's so many ways, you know, to get your content. Go to film festivals. I always stress that so much. I mean, they've been instrumental in my life. I know they've been inst- instrumental in your life, yeah. especially if you're an African-American filmmaker, you know, go to these festivals. The thing about the festivals is, is just making the connections with other like-minded people. Because there, there are people that I've met at festivals that not only have been involved in my ascent, but you know, have been collaborative with me in terms of you know, making things happen. And there are people out there that are in, in, in where you are. So if you're an actor you know, and, and you, you're just starting out and you meet a director that's just starting out, and you meet a screenwriter that's just starting out, boom. You know, yep. you, you, you know, you got the embryo stages of something that, that could become your huge. So I always stress going to film festivals and just whatever you're doing, you just got to keep doing it on whatever level. It doesn't have to be this level, you know, because it's, it's kind of like, you know, you have to massage that muscle in your brain. As a, as, a, as a filmmaker, as a producer, as a businessman that has taken a lot of risks, you know, uh, over the years, um, any regrets? You know, nah, man, to be honest with you, like, no, not really. Um, I think everything happens for a reason. And I think even if it wasn't filmed, if it was something else, I guess I just don't really believe in regrets. It's like, I, I honestly feel, you know, you know, I'm a spiritual guy and, you know, there's a verse that in God, all things happen for good. Not that all things will be good, but ultimately all things will happen for your good. So even I, I find positivity in the bad stuff. Um, that that has happened. And, and I can't really say too many bad things have happened to me. So in my career. So, so, so <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, uh, tell us how your faith has evolved during mm-hmm. this process of your career. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I mean, I was a Sunday school teacher, bro. <laughs> I was really, in it. yes, yes. <laughs> I was definitely in the church, and then it's funny in the in my and that was my early twenties, and then like I guess I don't know because I was working so much, or you know, mid twenties, early thirties. You know, I stopped going to school, got, I stopped going to church as much, but you know, because I would go to church like every Sunday, but you know, I still, you know, you know, guys in me, you know, um, and so. I feel that for me, um, again, you know, I, I, I really live by that, you know, in God, all things work together for good, right? And again, not all things will be good, but they will ultimately work together for your good. And, I, and, I, and every setback that I may have had, I always went back to that. And I knew that whatever's happening right now is going to end up happening for my greater good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, my friend David Mann says, you know, a setback is a setup for a comeback. Yep. So, you know, I, you know, I live that I, I live that that God has my back. And that what whatever, you know, what, what's the song? What does not kill you makes you strong? <laughs> that, that, that's how I feel about this industry, and the things that may not necessarily go your way. But you know, ultimately, man, it's like, you know, I feel it's an honor and privilege for, for me to do what what I do, you know, but the truth is, you know, you know, we're not saving lives here. <laughs> you know, right. we're making entertainment. Yeah. So, so, you know, so it's like when it, you know, it's as you know, sometimes it gets stressful and all that good stuff, but then you have to kind of, you have to kind of just sit back, you know, it's like, okay, what are we really doing here? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, we're, we're making entertainment. So everything's gonna be all right, in the words of Mr. Bob Marley. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of my spirituality, that that's how that's how it's allowed me to be very even keeled. And to um, to deal with the uh, ascents and descents that I've had, you know, in my career path, just so, knowing uh, God has my back. That's good, and that's and listen, that that is um, that is everything in this business. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And, you know, yeah. hopefully, you know, a lot more people get a chance to access that just in their lives. You know what I'm yes. saying? Yeah. This aside, but gets mm-hmm. in. Their lives. Um, as a, as a as a guy coming to you know coming from Brooklyn by way of London. Your brother, you know, is pretty established in his business. Mm-hmm. How could that been having another member of your family um, that is, you know, the real deal, Holyfield, you know, mm-hmm. in the industry? How has that kind of helped you in your career or giving you just a kind of a place to kind of go and, and get advice? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, my brother, he's an entertainment partner, he's a name partner at his, at his law firm now in LA and he represents a lot of big wigs. And, um, you know, it's funny though. It's like we 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 kind of still went separate paths. It's not like we intersected until we were both at a pretty high level, and that's when you know we our, our paths started to intersect. But um, first of all, he's my baby bro, and you know, and I love him. And, and and you know, he and I, we were the you know we would go to the movies together, and he and I would be quoting Spike Lee movies all over the house. So he he also had a love for film and television, but he loved the law, and so he took both passions his love for film and television and love for the law. And he became an entertainment attorney. You know, I, I, I was not interested in the law, even though I did work as a paralegal. The funny thing about working as a paralegal, I felt like I didn't go to law school because I was just waiting for my baby brother to go so that then their parents, my parents had the lawyer. So you don't have to look at me, right? So um, it's, been, it's, 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 it's been great because, you know, he's also, the funny thing, he's a lawyer, but he's still passionate about filmmaking. He's, he's passionate when he re- about the people he represents and the project that he represents. And that's the thing, you know, I, one of the things that I guess was shocking to me, Rob, is that, you know, I'm so passionate. I think just filmmakers and specifically directors, especially directors, they seem to be extremely passionate about the filmmaking pro- process. And it's funny that everyone doesn't share that passion. And that was like, and it seems the, the higher you go, the less the people that you work with have that passion. And I don't know if it's because money gets involved and becomes about the money and not about the project. Um, or I, I don't know, man, but it's like, I, I always had that. Dude, I, I would literally sweep up a set if I'm standing there doing nothing. I know something needs to be swept to get it done. I have no problem doing that. You know what I mean? It, I, I, and I come to work every day and I love what I do. Like even yeah. now, I mean, I've done you know, hundreds of this and that, but I just love what I do. And I feel like it's time for me to leave when I lose that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess one of the downsides is like working with people who sometimes don't 
don't share that passion <laughs> that you know are just in it for, for a paycheck. And I tell people, you know, dude, there's a lot of other easier ways to make money, <laughs> you know, than to do this. So, you know, if, if you're if you're an actor or writer, director, you know, you just gotta have that passion. You can't you can't do what we do and not be passionate about what you're doing. You, you, you talk about passion and we've all had experiences at times where you may work with somebody and, you know, it's a little tougher, you know, right. than other times. <laughs> what do you do when you, when you have those situations to where you're working with somebody and you guys don't necessarily vibe from a creative standpoint, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're supposed to be partnered to make this thing happen? How, you know, have right. you faced challenges like that? And if so, how have you gotten through that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I produced something with a, with a guy who was like an old school Hollywood guy. And he was kind of like an asshole to everybody. Um, and, and, you know, I, I tried to deflect and I tried to, you know, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very pro crew. So, you know, it's like, I'm always talking to the crew and, you know, making sure they're okay. And so if I, it was an incident where, you know, I found like, you know, he was talking to them you know, some kind of way that, you know, I, I felt wasn't respectful. And, you know, I took him to the side and I let him know, you know, hey, you know, my thoughts. And then he kind of turned on me, <laughs> right? So I'm like, and I, you know, that was, and it, I, I really don't have too many of these incidences, but, you know, this is one time when it was like, look, bro, it's like, you're not going to talk to me like that. You're not going to talk to them like that. And, and he actually said, so what are you going to do? You're going to hit me? Like, that's what he said. I said, no, I'm not going to hit you, but I will get you on the next flight out of here. I said, I will. And he was a director. And I said, I have no problem directing this movie for the rest of the way. You know, if you're going to continue, you know, to berate m myself and, and my crew. And, you know, you pretty much put them in line, you know. Um, so typically, I just, I, I typically kill them with niceness, to be honest with yeah. you. Because, I, you know, you, you, you can't come combat negativity with negativity. So, you know, if, if, if there's a problem individual or if there is a, um, a not like meeting of the minds, you know, it's one, it's all about communication. And ultimately it's all about, it's two things, communication and how you communicate. So mm -hmm. the thing is you have to understand, you know, like people talk about love language, you have to understand people's communication language, you know? And so you just have to learn that. But for me, I just kind of kill them with niceness. Now, the good thing about me is that, you know, I'm six, five, so if that don't work, I just start hovering. <laughs> we know you when, 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 when you're on set. We know right. that. We just start hovering. <laughs> so, nah, but, uh, you know, there definitely will be times where, um, you know, you'll, you'll deal with, let, let's just face it, difficult people, you know? And uh, for me, like I said, you know, you can't meet negativity with neg ne negativity, you know? Um, so I just try, try to kill them with niceness and kill them with love. And, and usually that works for me. As, as, as you progress in our, in our business and obviously had tremendous success, um, talk to me about, or talk to us about work-life balance. What does that look like for you? Yeah, well, then there's that. <laughs> then there's that. And, you know, I will say for me, it hasn't been equal at all. You know, like, you know, I, I recently just got married. Uh, oh, congratulations, man. Yeah, yeah, last yeah. year. Um, so it's, it's really just been all about work, work for me. Now, as I get older, I am starting to um, specifically take time. Like before it was like, okay, what's, cause it's always like, what's next, what's next, what's next? Cause no matter how successful you are, you always feel like if you don't have anything coming up, like, oh my gosh, it's like the end of my career. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's always like, what's so, and for me, I gotta have two things next. I, I'll, I'll leave them what's next. I, will, I wanna know what's next after that. Yeah. But, Having said that, I oh, at this point in my career, I try to um, spend some me time and now my wife time so that, you know, we, we, you know, we have the time away, away from work. And when I say away from work, it's not, okay, we're in the Bahamas, but I'm over here writing and, you know, and editing, you know, it's like, and, you know, and it's good. And the thing I've noticed about me, like I'm a football junkie, I love football. So, uh, you know, for 18 Sundays, on Sundays, you, you're not going to get me. Like Sunday is my day to Wusa. So I need to take time one day a week, you know, in the fall every day, just for me. And then the Saturday is for my family and that's it. But I got to say, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to maintain because, you know, we don't have standard work hours. It's not nine to five. And, you know, 
if you're fortunate, you're shooting all over the place, all over the country, all over the world. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's kind of tough, but um, I will say that it, it, when you're starting out, it's necessary. You know, it is, it, it's necessary, but hopefully you'll get to a point in your career where you could kind of start saying no to some things and understand that, you know, it's not all about work and that there are other things, you know, in life, you know, and I'm sure your family will tell you that, that you need to enjoy, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. When you're very, when you're starting out, it, you know, it's, it's very intense and you feel like you need to say yes, because, you know, you're trying to establish yourself, you right. know? So, so yeah, but uh, ultimately, hopefully, you know, if you continue to do good work, then you'll have the opportunity to start saying no and to kind of focus on yourself, which is important because even the physical, people don't really talk about the, the physical demands of filmmaking. You know, it's, it's a 12 hour day, 13 hour day, sometimes, you know, working in the elements, you know, sometimes, you know, climbing up and down mountains and stairs and this and that and buildings, you know, so there, there's actually a physical element to filmmaking. So it's important that, that you do take care of yourself. You mentioned uh, football, and I just wanted to that that's going to help us transition into this next these next couple of questions. Um, uh, favorite team, New York Giants, baby, all the way. Danny Dimes. Now, having said that, I am a big Patrick Mahomes fan. I can't front. I love me some Kansas City Chiefs, but I got to go. You got to rep where you come from, man. So New York Giants. I respect that. Listen, man, I'm, I'm How about you? out to you, man. The Eagles, baby. You know what I'm saying? So, you okay. know. So I'm, yeah. now having said that, I'm a big Alabama fan because my man Ricky Smiley, he got me all into Alabama. So I watched Jalen Hurts when he was there, and I really loved the dude. I followed him. I watched the Oklahoma games when he was there. When yep. the Eagles drafted him, I never watched Eagles games unless they were watching the Giants. I was watching the Eagles games. So I'm going to say I'm a huge Jalen Hurts fan. So I'm like mad conflicted. I am I can see root for the Eagles unless they play the Giants. It's like that. I respect that. I respect that. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was, you know, it was no, it was no question who I was going for in the Super Bowl, but because mm -hmm. Andy Reid is there, our old coach, and because it's Patrick Mahomes, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And just the fact that he was hurt and that he's, to be able to make it, to make it to the Super Bowl three times in five years, That's we haven't crazy. seen that since the Tom Brady era. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and because he's in that position, and obviously there's Jalen Hurts, my guy, you know, Patrick Mahomes represents the evolution of that position. So it's now it's not like the pocket passer. Now he's kind of opens it up. So, oh, that's yeah. you know, um, well, we'll see what y'all do this year. You guys are making some moves. Um, you definitely did your thing uh, last year. Um, so favorite movie. Wow. Uh, favorite favorite uh, movie. Well, let, 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 let me quantify okay. that. Okay. Favorite movie that you did not work on and were not associated with. Favorite okay. movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's easy. Um, so I'm going to say do the right thing. Okay. Because obviously, you know, I've made mention I'm a huge Spike fan. He's basically instrumental for, for my career, um, for motivating me to pursue my career. Let me be more specific. Um, Tyler Perry is instrumental for my career. Sure. Um, do the right thing because one, I'm a Brooklyn cat. It was shot in Brooklyn. You know, it's um, it was very timely and topical you know at the time that it came out um i still think it's probably his best work to date and um you know visually stunning um the fact that you know we're watching a movie take place in one day you know rarely you know do you see storytelling like that yeah that's an amazing soundtrack for us by us you know i just love love everything about it so if i were to say you know obviously i have like 10 favorite movies but if i'm gonna pick one it's gonna be do the right thing Favorite TV show that you are not have not worked on or are associated with? Probably Entourage. <laughs> I just love the show, man. It's like Great. I love those dudes. So and it's about, you know, it, being an insider in Hollywood, you know, it kind of tells like a lot of insider stuff that 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 you know I've I've personally been through. So um, you know, I, I like I like that series. Last great book you read. Um, the Audacity of Hope by Barack Obama, but I'm embarrassed because he's wrote, written like three books after that, but I just read that one. Never read, read another one after that. <laughs> and uh, favorite vacation spot? Um, I really like San Juan, Puerto Rico. Mm. Um, you know, beautiful beaches, you know, great food um great casinos and they actually for those of you who gamble you could actually eat at the table 
<laughs> like, you can't do that anywhere else. Like I'm playing blackjack and I'm like eating a burrito. It's awesome. So uh, yeah, I like, I like San Juan, Puerto Rico. And favorite song? Um, and it, uh, be, let me quantify that. Mm -hmm. What would be your theme song? A song that just bas basically best describes you. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, wow, like, wow, with these questions, bro. Like you hear the um, song, you're like, yeah. that's me. Yeah. Um, it's probably a Biggie song. Um, uh, I'll probably say Juicy, probably. <laughs> probably, yeah, Biggie's first. Yeah, I'll probably say Juicy. Um, and uh, in terms of favorite song, it'll probably be a Stevie Wonder song. Um, probably Isn't She Lovely, because that's what I would sing. That's what I would always sing to my daughter. So yeah, Isn't She Lovely. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And uh, um, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be remembered for one, just being a good person, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and um, leaving a legacy of helping people um, achieve their career goals in this industry while also just doing good work, you know, just making good material. Yeah. Well, listen, man, I, you know, I want to just take a second just to kind of give you, you know, a shout out, you know, just um, as somebody that has been around you for a long time. And I feel like we kind of came up together in the, yeah. you know, ABFF film yeah. space and yeah. the, in, the, in the Atlanta it's Jeff Friday, space. Jeff and Nicole, shout out. Come on, man. <laughs> Jeff Friday, yeah, absolutely. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Even you look back to BFF, Warrington Hudlin, yeah, Warrington Hudlin, you know, yeah. Byron mm -hmm. Allen, all those yeah. folks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, I just want to give you just a shout just for always looking to, and working to push the culture forward and even just the spirit of just trying to keep it positive and, you know, putting people on and just, um, you know, that means a lot to filmmakers out there. That means a lot to people out there. That means a lot, you know, to people that are just looking to be entertained and for you being a part of every aspect of that, you know, from a people standpoint, um, a spirit standpoint and a business and creative standpoint, that's big. So just want to just give you a shout on just uh, representing and being who you are. Thanks, and bro. And to like, you know, shine. Thanks, bro. I appreciate that. Same to you. And, you know, it's, you know, it, it, you know, you just feel good. You know, you, you know, it's like I'm sitting at home and I'm watching. I see something you know, directed by Rob Hardy, you know, directed by Carl Sheen, directed by, you know, just uh, Pete Chapman, just all these great dudes. You know, it just it just makes you feel good. And, you know, it, it makes you, you know, continue to understand that there's room for all of us. Yep. there's room for all of us you know and when one of us makes it you know that makes it just a little bit easier for the next one to make it you know what i mean so you know just keep doing what you're doing i appreciate you i appreciate the kind words but you know you affect me the same way bro so thank you hey it's all love man uh any any last words no just um you know just have passion you know have purpose and have a plan gotta have a plan because you know if you if, if you plan if you fail to plan you plan to fail a thousand percent well listen uh brother roger bob we thank you again for your time for your energy for your insight for your wisdom um can't wait to do this again but it reminds me we need to just get up together get get together you know um socially and do a little yes something. sir absolutely you got it i'm there all right so we're gonna make that happen but anyway thank you next, again next for time we us. play the giants we're gonna watch that game together <laughs> okay cool cool well thank you all for uh tuning in with us tonight and uh you know we'll see you soon all right take care let me find out how to stop this ah <laughs>